This is Jordan Poyer, safety for the Buffalo Bills, and you are now listening to Cover One Buffalo Podcast. Let's go. Welcome, everybody. This is Greg Thompson with Cover One Buffalo, and I, I want to talk a little bit today about a new app that we're going to be joining with called Locker Room. And Locker Room is going to be an audio platform that allows me to jump on, give breaking news, talk with other folks, and be able to even bring on guests and uh, listeners if you guys want to come on and, and jump in and give me your takes or ask me questions live on the air. So uh, it's in the beta mode uh, for the App Store with Apple right now, and it's going to be launching. Uh, on the app store here in the next two weeks you're gonna see a lot of people out there a lot of folks you've heard names of are going to be out there and I'm, I'm honored to be able to be part of that uh, initial launch and some of the early adopters of this new platform so uh, take a look for locker room today I am jumping on there with our AFC East roundtable excited to be able to talk with the guys there and uh, give a little bit of insight into what's going on you hear us talk about the game last night with Kansas City you hear us talk about what other pieces were going on but it was a it was a lot of fun so you'll hear some names that you may recognize um, Justin Hare that uh, covers the Dolphins, Pat Lane, uh, who does the, the Patriots, Pat's pulpit for uh, the Patriots. Uh, Going to be an interesting conversation. Check out what everybody thinks and uh, check out uh, the locker room on the App Store when he launches. Watson it, it, running for his life all night. Like he, it was, yeah, it's oh. just not the same caliber of team. It almost looked like you had a like a a pro team and then like a sub pro team, like a you know, right. Well, it, and the the bad news for them is, I mean, that's not the best defense they're going to play this year. Oh no, no. far. Oh, I mean, no, the no, Chiefs no. have some pieces. I mean, Chris Jones and Frank Clark are legit, but I mean, they're going to play better defenses. That's a problem. Well, yeah, yeah. they're going to play better defenses in the division. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Tennessee will probably be better. Indianapolis might be better. Yeah, they just had it tomorrow. Uh, yeah, DeForest Buckner. That's, that's going to get real. Yeah, and yeah. you know what? I I think, and and we're going to see this. I know we're going to see this on Sunday with both Bills, Jets, and Dolphins, Patriots. There's going to be some rust that yeah. the teams have to not you know knock off. But Kansas City had no rust. They're like, no, yeah. we're just we're well, getting right back into it. So in in my projection for it, you know, I said, hey, all off season. Teams have been talking about, or people have been talking about, hey, continuity is going to matter. All these other pieces are going to be a huge advantage. It'll kind of level out as the season goes on. If that's true, the the Bills should smoke the Jets. This shouldn't be a close game. Like, if everybody's going to keep harping on that, (laughs) the Bills had the most continuity and the most returning snaps. The Jets had the second least. Last night didn't make me feel any less good about that take. (laughs) Like, if that stuff matters as much as people keep trying to say, then it shouldn't be a good game like that. That stuff should carry over. This should be an ugly game. And then later in the year, it levels out because talent will, will, you know, fix itself and get up to that level. But I, I'm really curious, does that carry over as much as last night or are the chiefs just special because they have special talent? I, I, I'm really curious. Well, I think the chiefs are special, but also, as I said, I just think the Texans stink. I mean, they're just not, they're just not that good. <laughs> You know, so it's like, and you look at, look at what Mahomes did, you know, look at his, his passing chart from, from last night. You know, if that's, and I tweeted this out today, if that's Tom Brady's passing chart, people are all over him because he's a dink and dunker, right? Like how many passes, I don't think he completed one pass last night that was more than 10 yards downfield. No, I don't think he did at all. I think he attempted one that was deep, but beyond that, I don't think he even, I think he attempted one pass that was deep and he didn't even attempt one. I'm talking about Mahomes now, not Watson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't think he even attempted one that was, that was very far down the field. So like, so that's the one, that's the thing for me where I look at it and say, well, you know, that's, you know, uh, the, they scale down the offense, right? Cause obviously that's not the chief's offense. They scale down the offense. They make it simple for the beginning. And then you go from there, you know, and I think you're going to see the same thing from all from everywhere and from everyone around around the league. It's just that the talent disparity between the Chiefs and the Texans is ridiculous. And so that's why the Chiefs run away with it, because even if they're playing a scaled down version of their offense, they're still 100 times better than the Texans are. And so it's an easy win, you know. Yeah, and I think it was also a, a product of the, of Andy Reid and the Chiefs saying, like, listen, you know, we, we're returning all the championship pieces, but we know that we haven't played in a while, and so we're going to give the ball to the guys who we know will be, you know, 
Pat, you don't have to throw 25 yards downfield. You don't have to make these splash plays. Give the right. ball to CEH, give the ball to Sammy, give it to Tyreek, and let them do what they do. And, and it, and it works to perfection. And I also, I, I think it just goes to show how right you are, uh, how, how right you are in terms of the fact that, you know, when you're bringing in new pieces, it is going to take a little bit of time, especially in this year. Uh, you know, Greg, you said, and, and, you know, we saw that with Cobb, we saw that with, um, Will Fuller trying to be the number one. Yeah. And it just, it, they're not quite ready yet. It's not like the Texans are terrible teams in, in terms of talent. Like they have some pieces, but I mean, they're nowhere near the Chiefs. And so when you have that plus the lack of continuity, I think right. it makes a huge difference. And I, Pat, I think we're going to see that so much week with this Dolphins Patriots game. It, it's going to be a sloppy game. Like it, I think it's going to be oh, close, absolutely. but I think it's going to be a sloppy game because well, Cam. Both teams. Yeah, for yeah. sure. There's so many new pieces on each side. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I was upset that they're not starting to. Uh, I mean, Flores is way too smart to do that. Yeah. But I mean, Tua in his first game playing against Belichick, who never <laughs> loses to rookie quarterbacks. Never mind quarterbacks making their first career start. Uh, when they haven't even had a preseason, like that would have been an absolute bloodbath. And Flo knows that, so he would never let that happen, you know. And I think they're going to be pretty competitive this year. And I think I wouldn't be surprised to see Fitzpatrick start, if not the whole year, the vast majority of the year. Oh, I think he goes 50, 75 percent. I don't think they go the whole year without giving Tua any reps. But, right. I mean, what what if they start – you know, four and three, five and four, and that they're in the running with that seventh wild card spot. And now all of a sudden you're like, well, we do want to give them some run, but how do we bench the guy who's given us a winning record? Right. If, if they, you know, if it's two and five, if it's three and six, I think they're all of a sudden it's easier, mm-hmm. but I, I think they're going to have a decent team. I think they're going to be a 500 ish team. And if they start out, okay, it's going to be tough to pull them out of there. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy you guys brought that up because we were actually talking about this on our on the the podcast I host. We we did an episode on here yesterday. Uh, we usually do a dolphin centric episode each week, and we talked about when will Tua start. And you know our position on that, and me and my co-host, it's changed a bit since the beginning of the off season. I think we all were targeting that week. What is it? Week twelve, week thirteen after they come off their bye and they play the Jets. It's like an easy, easy soft game. Two will have a bye to get ready. And it made sense. And then we we're talking about it like, you know, I, it's not necessarily the date or the week or the opponent that's going to make the most, uh, that's going to have the biggest impact. It's just going to be how, how Fitz is playing. If Fitz is winning games and the team's in a playoff position and, you know, everyone's rallying around your veteran quarterback who knows what he's doing, uh, there's no reason to, to throw Tua in there. But if Fitz is losing games and, you know, you're 1-4 to start the year, and you want to see what your rookie quarterback has, then you throw him out there. I think it's going to be a lot more about the winning record and the quality of Fitz's play rather than who we're playing and when. That week 11 bye is critical. It's 10 games. You're going to know where you stand, six games to go. And that's just like I said, you know, if it's six and four, five and five, I don't see how you make the move if it's three and seven. If it's something like that, all of a sudden that's a lot easier to give him the bye week and the two week run up to the next game and a six week debut going through there. I, I just I, I think there's a chance that they're in the running and that they're doing okay and that they've pulled off some games and you know all those defensive pieces have started to kind of connect. I, I think there's a shot he only gets a three or four game run at the end of the year. Not like Mahomes, but that idea of just, Hey, we know we have something special here. We're going to let him play a game or two and then hand the keys to him the following year. I I think there's a chance it's a really short window. Yeah. I just think the the thing for me is that, you know, what you have in Fitzpatrick, like, you know, what you have, right? Fitzpatrick is going to be really good for eight out of the 16 games. And then for five out of those, out of the other games, he's going to be just dreadful. And then for like three of those games, he's going to be like pretty good. You know, like, you know what you're getting from him. So you can go eight and eight, you can go like nine and seven, 10 and six, but that's your ceiling. Like you're not getting any better than that. If Ryan Fitzpatrick is your quarterback and you know that, and that's okay. If you're like in rebuilding mode, but I just think, I think what it's going to have, what it's going to come down to is, are you going to see that like, Long term, you're going to say, okay, two is really lighting it up in practice, and we feel like he's ready. I think as soon as Tua is ready, regardless of their record, 
you should put him in because Fitzpatrick is not going to get you to the Super Bowl. That's not going to happen. Right. And so, and, and so for me, you know, obviously you don't want to, you don't want to kill the chemistry and everything like that. And, and I guess if everyone's rallying around Fitzpatrick and no one wants to see two out there, like, okay, fine. But to me, it's like, if he's the future and he's really lighting it up in practice, you got to get him on the field because you know what you have in Fitzpatrick. It's not like, it's not like, oh, we can get hot and he win the Super Bowl. It's like, no, that's, that's not going to happen. And you know, that's not going to happen. So instead of, instead of playing it out with him and losing in the first round of the playoffs, what do you throw two in? You see what he can do for a few games and then the playoffs start and you see what happens, you know? And that, that's, that's what I would do. At least I just feel like it makes too much sense to do that. Um, you know, that's what Baltimore did with, with, uh, with Lamar Jackson. They made the playoffs. He started the playoff game and they lost obviously, but like, but I just feel like it makes a lot of sense to do that with Tua, even if they're playing okay and they're going to probably make the playoffs. I think Tua still has to go in there if he's ready. So, and that if he's ready point is obviously the most key. With the hip injury, it seems like that's not the concern anymore. Uh, right. From everything everyone's saying, it's like, okay, the hip's fine. He's ready athletically. Like in terms of his health, he's ready. It's just in terms of the fact that he's a rookie who didn't play any preseason games and who had a shortened training camp and no OTAs, is he totally gelled with the entire offense and the entire team and mentally with the scheme and all of those things? Is he ready in that regard? That's probably the hang up right now because it didn't seem particularly close in terms of like the quote unquote quarterback competition they had in camp. It seemed like it was Fitz's job from the beginning. The one reason I could see it being slightly earlier if they think he's totally ready with regards to the way the team might be playing is the fact that the Dolphins have a really, really hard schedule to start the year outside of their Jacksonville game in week three. They play New England, obviously very good defense. Buffalo, obviously very good defense. And then you have two really strong playoff teams in Seattle and San Francisco. So uh, like this team, as much as I like to think the Dolphins are going to do very well, I, I mean, in terms of the odds, they're probably not going to be have a winning record going into week six, seven and eight. Uh, and they go over to the West Coast in those games. But, um, you know, I, I think if, if two is ready, they'll have reason to put him in because I'm not so sure the Dolphins will be able to win a bunch of games out of the gate, just given, you know, the opponents that play. Well, and I have a question for you because one of the reasons I like Brian Flores so much is that I think, and skewing all the way to the basketball, I think what the Sixers messed up in their rebuild was assuming that tanking and collecting assets had no impact culturally locker room in how you build your habits and things like that. And that that stuff I think matters And that last year they didn't throw it away. They did play hard down the, down the stretch. I think that's why he got so much buy-in. I think that's why the team's behind him so much. I think that thing matters. And that if you all of a sudden pivot, not that he can't thread the needle and still say this the right way and pull it off. But if you're not careful and you turn it into, Hey, I know I said those things last year and that Fitz is still our best shot at winning Sunday, but you know, the future is what matters here. So we got to throw this guy out there. And I know you guys are bleeding and sweating to do everything you can to win the game, but you know, the future is just more important than that. We got to put this guy in there. You could lose that and, and chip away at that really quickly where do you think that falls within that locker room? And is it as simple as, Hey, they see it in practice. And unless they see it as an obvious fit, you can't do it. Or do you think you can sell them on that, that, Hey, we need to find out one way or the other. Uh, You know what? I'm, I'm so happy you asked that just because I, I'm not, that's one of the things with this team that I am not worried about even a little bit because Flores loves Fitzpatrick he they the two of them just seem like best friends like with all the I mean obviously it's hard to know when we're not in the locker room and they're with all the the press conferences (laughs) yeah like with with all the press conferences and with all the things that they've said about each other in interviews with every reporter and what the reporters have talked about you know we were talking about Armando and Omar Kelly and all these guys the guys who talk to the coaches and players uh, you know a little bit more closely it seems like Flores loves the heck out of Fitzpatrick and he also seems like he, like if you if you look back at the rosters that he threw out there last year he didn't give a crap what your draft pedigree was he didn't give a crap what your salary number is if you were playing better you were on the field and that just seems to be his mantra all the time uh so i'm not particularly worried about him saying okay even though we're winning i need to see what Tua can do he he just he wants to win 
And the whole team also loves Fitzpatrick from what it seems and sounds like. So um, I think as long as Fitzpatrick is winning and they're playing well, which, again, I think will be very tough to start the season given their opponents. Uh, but I, I think Fitzpatrick will be out there as long as he's winning. Well, yeah. and I think I think the the comparison to the Sixers is is very interesting because yeah, you know the Sixers always had the mantra of trust the process, right? And so, like to me, what that does, what that says, is that okay, yes, we're going to trust the process, but you know that means that we're not, we don't have it right now. And those guys are going to come in and save this franchise, right? That's what's going to happen. We're going to tank. We're going to be terrible. And then those guys are going to come in and save the franchise. And I think in football, you can't, obviously you can't do that anyways. It's not one or two guys. It's a, it's an entire roster full of guys. And you have a leader there in Flores that I just, I love him so much. He just, he was just so good here in New England, and he's such a good coach. And I think last year, the mantra for him, at least, or the attitude that he instilled in that locker room was, listen, the, the GM can do whatever the hell he wants. He could trade all our players and he can do whatever. But the reason why we got rid of Minka Fitzpatrick is because he doesn't want to play down here. He doesn't want to do what we ask him to do. He's not willing to buy in. So if that's the case, see you later and we'll get a draft pick for you. And then, you know, Laramie Tunsil, he's here. Great. He's not going to take a pay cut. We're not going to sign him. We don't think he's the future. See you later. We're going to get a draft pick for him. And then, yes, these draft picks are going to come in and, and compete and play. But now you need to prove as to why you're going to be part of this rebuild as well. We're going to change the culture here. We're going to change this team. And you need to go out and prove why you're going to be someone that's going to change this team with us. And I think that when you have an attitude like that, you see what you saw down the stretch from the Dolphins last year, which was we're not giving up. Like we're playing hard because uh, we respect this coach and we feel like we want to be part of this rebuild. We're not just here to like suck and then hopefully rebuild next year. Like, no, we're we're an integral part of this and we need to prove that we're a part of that in order to be part of it next year, you know? Well, and I, I mean, take a look at what the Bills had three years ago when they accidentally backed into the playoffs. If that just happens right. differently, there's a strategic argument that they would have been better off not doing that and not going on that run and finishing with the 21st pick that they had to combine with a bunch of other assets to move up to draft a quarterback. And that strategically, there was plenty of argument there, but you then don't get the cachet to cut loose the guys they did in the second year and eat all the dead cap and go through that and let all the young guys get a crazy amount of reps and go through everything that they combine there. If all of a sudden now that's your second losing season, that's your second rough stretch. Instead, now you get playoffs two out of the first three years. You already built that cachet. You built that trust. It's just so much more valuable that way. And although Flores, they didn't make the playoffs in that run, it still was a much different tenor and feeling of the season that they had than just throwing it all away, finishing one in 15. When I, I think there was a point where they were probably the worst point differential in NFL history halfway yeah. through the year. And yeah. then instead pivoting you now have buy-in and it, it it's just so hard to to discount how powerful that is yeah and and i think that speaks to flores caliber as a as a leader and and I'll, you know there's two parts to being a head coach there's the, the the person management side of it being a leader in the locker room being a leader of, of ben as the media likes to say and then there's also the football acumen and obviously in terms of testing his football acumen and his ability to be a football coach well, that, you know, that, that remains to be seen. He went five and 11. Now he needs to win some games. But I think what the fact that he was able to manage what happened last year, the trading of players and all that, and still have everyone buy in shows how, how strong of a leader he is and how good he is at getting people to buy in and rally behind. And, and we've heard people say over and over again that Flores seems to really care about the people that he's leading. You know, he, he cares about their lives. And, and again, we're not in the locker room, but that's what players say about him. And, and, and they don't say that about just anyone. Like, players don't go out and say that about every head coach on every team. So I think it just goes to show what kind of a leader he is. And they, the, the Dolphins found their guy in that regard. Hopefully, they also found their guy in terms of the one who could bring wins on, you know, into the, into the win column. But they definitely found their guy in terms of who's the right person to lead the, the locker room. Right. Uh, really good question from Ethan. He put into the chat here. Who has the better five-year outlook, the Finns or the Bills? Oh, Greg, you want to take that first? 
<laughs> um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, pr- I'll take the M and M route. I'll take away your ammo before you guys come back in the rap battle. Um, I, obviously it comes down to Josh Allen and, and is he yeah. real or not? So let's take a couple different paths there. I think Chris Greer collected more assets than Brandon Bean did, but I think Brandon Bean has proven that his hit rate and the value of how he's invested the signings and picks has a proven track record. I don't think we've seen that yet with Greer. I I don't know that we've seen that it isn't, but I know Austin Jackson wouldn't have been my pick at that first round pick. I don't think he was the best available player. There's a couple that I question in some of the assets. I think there were some good players that were signed that were higher costs than what I thought was the right value. So I want to see that prove out. I think they have a higher capacity for the next five years because they collected a historic amount of draft capital and cap room. And if you use that, it can go really far. And that I saw what everybody else saw scouting to a, he has an incredible ceiling ahead of him. We don't know if he's going to reach that, but I think that you can make an argument. They have a higher ceiling. I feel more confident right now in that the bills have a much higher floor and that I feel more confident they're going to be good. How good they become is, does Josh Allen take that next step? But the roster around them, I think that if Greer builds and other 52 around Tua that Brandon Bean built around Josh Allen, that would be a huge victory, and he would have to hit on a lot of picks and a lot of signings to build it as strong as what they built in Buffalo, and then it can come down to the quarterbacks. I think he has the tools to do it, the assets, accumulated a great amount of capital to make it a possibility. I don't know that we've seen that those signings and picks have hit yet. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a... Uh... I think that's a pretty perfect assessment in terms of Greer's capability of finding talent. The, 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 the problem is that there's been, there's been just too many high profile misses. I mean, the Charles Harris pick is the most notable, but there, there are plenty trading up for Cordry Tankersley at cornerback, Leonce Carew. There, there are so many players who, you know, you wished had panned out the passing on TJ Watt. I mean, like there, there are quite a few that, that really just didn't make a whole lot of sense. I get the, the free agency concern. There were so, I mean, there were some players that I think were a little bit overpaid, but that seemed to what the market was demanding. I like the overall strategy. I do. I like I like the building in the trenches, which he's certainly emphasized quite a bit. I mean, that's how you build a football team. I obviously adore the fact that he brought in Tua. I think Tua's a higher ceiling quarterback, uh, you know, safer injury concerns than Josh Allen. And I think in general, I really like Miami's plan. I love Brian Flores as a head coach too. So I think if the Dolphins are able to, as you said, build that 52 around to uh, like the Bills built around Josh Allen, I like Miami's prospects in terms of a ceiling just because I think Tua has a higher ceiling than Josh Allen. Josh Allen, I think, is a phenomenal talent, but the accuracy concern, I just, it's hard for me to get past the accuracy concerns. And I know that's everyone's knock on the guy, but it's a fair knock. I mean, there are some throws where you're just like, what the heck happened there? He is a phenomenal athlete, he has a ridiculous arm, and I think he has great potential as a quarterback in the NFL. Um, but I, I'm, I'm about ready to say, okay, we need to see it come together now uh, for him to be the guy of the future in, in Buffalo. Um, I also think Buffalo has done a phenomenal job in terms of an overall plan, though. Building the defense with Sean McDermott, who's obviously a phenomenal defensive coach, uh, and they finally brought in some pieces to support Allen with Zach Moss and Stephon Diggs. So if you had to, if you had to I, I think you put it perfectly, Bills have a much higher floor for the next five years. I think the Dolphins have a higher ceiling. All right, Pat, you're the tiebreaker. So, um, yeah, tough, tough, tough decision here. I got to be honest. I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, sometimes it comes down to the coaches. I, I love, um, I love both of them. I really do like them both quite a bit. I think they're good young coaches. Um, but you know, it, it's just it's it's one of those things where it's like it, it's it's challenging uh, to kind of look at. I think you're right about the higher floor for the Bills. I just don't, oh, man. I just don't know if I if I trust him. But the problem is, I don't know if I trust Tua. So that you, you haven't seen him in, a, in an NFL game, and so there's so many question marks. Um, but I'm I'm going to go with uh, with the Dolphins five years from now simply because it's New England South uh, and there's so many former Patriots players down there 
that I think I think that culture gets built up, and and so much of what Belichick has done has been tried to be. You look at look at the guys that have come out of his system. Charlie Weiss stunk. Romeo Cornell stunk. Like Mangini stunk. All these guys, they stink. All of them. Bill O'Brien's off. He's a he's terrible. He's a terrible game manager. He's a terrible GM. He's and a really bad GM. <laughs> it's so bad. But you look Worst at GM what I've ever seen. It's it's unreal. And now he's his, now he's his own boss, so he can't even fire himself. But but either way, it's um, you know, you look at what Flores has been able to do down there, and and I know it's only been one year, but like he's instilling some of that stuff that Belichick has always instilled in New England. And and I feel like he went down there and cleaned house. And I, I'll never forget um, when Parcells came here in '93. Uh, their big their big receiver was Irving Fryer. Was their big receiver? He was the best receiver they ever had, and he was unbelievable. And blah blah blah, and all this other stuff. And he came in, and and I don't know if he missed a meeting or he gave Parcells some attitude, or he just. He just didn't fit with what Parcells wanted to do. And he, you could see it with his attitude on day one. And Parcells walked, open, uh, walked up to him and said, clean all your damn locker, you're out of here. See ya. And he just cut. <laughs> and he just like, you're out. You know, and, and, and Flores did that, the same thing. You know, you look at the guys that he, that he shipped out of town that, you know, Mink is doing great in, in, in uh, Pittsburgh, but he wasn't buying in, in, in uh, Miami. So see you later. You're not going to buy in, you're gone. Like and you you start that culture and McDermott's done a great job of it too. I just I just can't buy into Josh Allen. I can't do it. And maybe he takes a few steps this year. And if he does, I think the Bills. I honestly think the Bills could contend for Super Bowl this year if Josh Allen can take a few steps forward. And I know that that's all asking a lot with the Chiefs and the and the Ravens and everything. But if the Ravens are going to take a step back this year. Guarantee it. Put that on paper right now. Write it in pen. Write it in permanent marker. The Ravens are taking a step back this year, um, but like, but the the question is, it, it revolves around Josh Allen. Can he take that next step? And really, I think it's more like two or three steps. So that's really yeah. the question. Can he do that? And if he can, the Bills are going to be a team to be, to be reckoned with. But I just think Miami has a lot of great pieces there. They've done a lot of great things. I like where they're going. In five years, I think they'll be in a better position than the Bills are. And I built, I, I've kind of built it up that way that it's a twofold benefit when you build the roster the way they have. I've made the argument, I think Brandon Bean's built the best other 52 in the NFL. I think that it's the deepest roster in the NFL. And that when you do that, you give yourself a twofold benefit that one, if Josh Allen takes, and I think you're right, the, the, the two full steps forward, not just one, two full yeah. steps forward in his development, in his accuracy with the deep ball, with his decision making, all the other pieces, you can go on a Super Bowl run. The other peripheral benefit is if he doesn't, there's no excuse. There's no other downside. There's no other question or variable that, oh, was it that we didn't get him enough protection? Oh, did he not have enough weapons? Right. Uh, was it that he didn't have a running game to support it? Was the defense bad and put him into different bad positions? No, it's none of those things. All of them are excellent. <laughs> and that yeah. it's putting him in a spot where you've eliminated all variables and you can now make a sound decision that is he the guy for this franchise going forward. And I've always made the claim, like, people get mad when they compare him to Jamarcus Russell and Jeff George. And I've told Bills fans, it's actually accurate, except I think he can become what Jeff George or Jamarcus Russell were supposed to be. Because the right. difference is he has a world-renowned work ethic and a great amount of humility and willingness mm -hmm. to be coached and, after, you know, living with Jordan Palmer all off season and only drilling mechanics and, you know, platform and footwork and hand placement and all those things over and over and over again. Those guys never did that. And they had all the old, all world potential, but they sat on it and never did anything. And that if he doesn't pan out, it's not going to be because of work ethic. It's not going to be because of a lack of effort. It's going to be because he just simply can't do it. And that I bought into that to say, hey, I know it'll be a historic anomaly. I know it's someone that his college profile has never transitioned into a successful player in the NFL. The guys don't normally take a huge step going into year three. But guys also in that position normally went to elite 11 camps in high school and seven on seven summer leagues and ran air raid systems in college. 
He went to junior college and transferred to Wyoming and then threw 200 pass attempts. He's way behind the growth curve of all those other guys. He has the capacity to improve going into year three that most other quarterbacks like Baker Mayfield, who's 10,000 reps ahead of him is already developed. He is what he is. He's not going to get better because he's already at the level he's going to get to. He has that capacity. Now that only comes if he does improve and work and do those things, but he has the capacity to do that that most guys normally don't. So we're going to know one way or the other, and it's going to be laid completely bare. Either he is a historic anomaly who can outproduce those metrics and the grades and the college film because of those other opportunities. Or if he doesn't, they know it's purely on him and they can move on and get a veteran. They can win with this Super Bowl caliber uh, roster and Brandon Bean built it to have that pivot point before the fifth year option came due. That's a great point. It's a great point. I think so. It brings me to, I mean, to Patriots talk finally. Uh, you know, and I, I think, held off as long as I could. <laughs> but I think what's interesting about it is that the Patriots are now in a position that that you know they're a year or two before where where the Bills and the Dolphins are because. You know, the quarterback turnover is coming. Obviously, you have Cam Newton this year, and how does he play? And if he plays well enough, does that mean he's getting a contract extension, right? Will, will they sign him next year? Will they not? Like, that's that's a question we don't know the answer to, obviously. Um, I think if Cam plays well enough, he won't be here unless he really wants to be here and he takes a pay cut. But if someone's going to give him a ton of money to play next year, um, I think that he leaves and plays next year. So then the question is, is Jarrett Stidham the next quarterback? And if he isn't, how quickly can Belichick find the next guy? Because if you look at the rest of the roster, and I know they lost a ton of pieces on defense, but I, I thought they brought in a lot of talent defensively. Their secondary is one of the best in the league, if not the best in the league. Um, and so the question now becomes, when do they find the next the next quarterback? And how long is it going to take for that quarterback to kind of become – the guy, right? Gilmore's got one year left after this after this deal. I don't know if you guys saw, but they bumped his salary up to fifteen and a half. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And so, uh, but he's done. I think after next year. So then, do they sign him? J.C. Jackson's done after this year. So then, do they do they sign him? He's been one of the best. I mean, you look at PFF. I mean, he was second overall cornerback on the list last year according to pro football focus, Jonathan Jones, the third corner. He was a top 10 corner last year. You know, if you look at PFF, so they have some really great talent on, on, in the defensive secondary, but they're going to have to pick and choose those guys. You know, they let Jamie Collins walk. They let Kyle Van Noy walk high tower ops out. So he'll be back next year, but they let a Landon Roberts go. So they have a ton of pieces they have to fill, but they also have a lot of potential there and they have a ridiculous amount of, of the middle talent, like the middle of their roster is very talented. Um, and which is what Belichick always does, right? It's, it's, you know, the top of the level talent, if you have it great, but the middle of the level talent, if you have a ton of that, that's where you really are successful. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see if Sidham is the guy I personally think he can be. Um, but it's just a question of whether, whether he can put it all together and, and then what happens? You know, are you able to keep all the all the talent around? Are you able to develop your young guys and make them into into stars? Which Belichick does, typically does a good job of doing that. Like, so there's a lot of question marks going forward. I think this year they're going to be okay, but the, there's a ton of question marks moving forward. And like I said, in two years, we might be having the same exact conversation that you guys are having about the Bills and the Dolphins about the Patriots. Yeah, so I mean, looking looking ahead at those next couple of years. So, uh, do you, well, I guess here's the first question before I go to the future. Do you think the Patriots are contending for a playoff run, cha- you know, AFC Championship, Super Bowl type season right now? The Patriots, I would be. I don't want to say I'd be surprised, um, but I would be a little surprised if they don't win the division this year. Yep. Bill Belichick, okay, I don't know their coach. I, Bill Belichick's still their coach. They still have a ton right. of talent. And Cam, I don't know what Cam has left in the tank, but if he's anywhere near as good as he was in 2017, 2018, there's no reason they shouldn't at least win the division. They still can't compete with Kansas City. Uh, but it, on for one game, there's a possibility at least. 
Okay, so the, the reason I was asking that is because when we're looking at their future, this is the first time in obviously decades that we're talking about, you know, if Cam plays really, really well, then he might go elsewhere. And if Cam doesn't, st- if Cam you know, stinks, then he's obviously, you're not going to want him as quarterback next year. So the Patriots will probably be looking for a quarterback next year. But if they play that well, if their division champs are close to it, it's going to be very difficult for them to get a top tier guy. So are you even considering, is the thought entering your mind like, oh, it'd be so cool if we got Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields? Because if it is, then not at all. Not at all. Never going to happen. It's not going to happen. And I know it's not going to happen. And so I'm okay with that. The one thing I will say with the Patriots, well, and again, the Patriots don't necessarily have it on their side, but it's kind of with everyone. If the NFL season didn't happen, if the college football season didn't happen last year, Joe Burrow was a fifth round pick, right? So like, you don't know. There's so much unknown this year more than any other year, right? So yes, Lawrence should go number one overall because he's clearly above a head and shoulders above everyone else. But that next guy, you don't even know who that is. Like there are guys out there that we haven't even seen yet as a starter that could be the guy. We just haven't seen them yet. And so will those guys come out? Maybe not. Maybe they'll wait another year. I don't know. You know, but it's going to be interesting to kind of see what happens there. I just think for me, I don't yeah, I don't think that that's the way. And Belichick never would never do that. He's never going to tank. He shit all over the Colts when they tanked, when they didn't have, uh, when they didn't have, when they sucked for luck. Like, he, I mean, he was, he was not. He was not shy about about, you know, talking down to them. I think I'd be completely blown away if they were to tank and they have too much talent. Really, honestly, they have too much talent to tank, um, you know, to finish bad enough to have a shot at one of those two guys. Um, yeah, the Jags, the Jets, the Redskins, those teams, the Panthers, they're going to be real bad trying to be good, let alone to have a try right. as much talent in the decision making that Belichick has. There's no way. Yeah. So the, Can I just tell you one thing before yeah. you continue. I just just the, just the unprecedented run the Patriots have been on. Just so people are aware of this, and some people don't realize this, but since the year two thousand one, the Patriots have not finished outside record wise. Have not finished outside of the first spot in the AFC East since two thousand one. So I know they didn't win the division in 02 and they didn't win the division in '08. They didn't make the playoffs in either of those two years, but they finished tied for first and lost because of a tiebreaker and then didn't make the playoffs because they didn't get a wild card spot. But they literally have not finished record wise outside of the top spot in the AFC East since 2001. So it's just the run they've been on is just so ridiculously unprecedented that, um, I mean, it's just, it's insane. So Greg, in case we didn't remember how bad our teams have been and how good the Patriots have been. Uh, <laughs> case you want Oh, 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 I remember. <laughs> there's, uh, there's our mind there. Um, so, and, I, and, and you're right. I, I, that's why I, that's what I was assuming you would say. I was, I was just curious if that thought had entered your mind because I've seen it written uh, at least a dozen times around the internet right now. Oh, what if the Patriots the, get Trevor Lawrence? There was but, a small window before Cam signed right. after all the opt-outs where I still didn't believe it, but I understood the topic. I, did, I yeah. knew it wasn't correct, yeah. but before Cam signed, after the opt-out, opt out, there was like a one-week period where I was like, huh, I wonder if they're going to do it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just not realistic. Right. That makes sense. So, I mean, so Pat, then what and, – and then I want, I want to get into a little bit of Jets talk before – before we got to jump off, just just to give some just to give some you know credence to our, our fourth our fourth member of our of our division, but what what is your ideal scenario for eh. for the Patriots at quarterback then for the next bunch? Like, what, what would you like to see them go in terms of direction at quarterback for the next three years? You know, so it's a good they, question. I, I mean, mean nice well, the, so the real question is going to be, you know, what does Cam bring to the table? Is he the is he the Cam of old? Um, and if he is, then I think it, that he presents a strong case to come back um, okay. if that's the case. But if he isn't, well, then you, now you're moving on from Cam. I'm a believer in Stidham. I just I um, I just feel like he has something that they like a lot. He makes decision. His decision making is very quick. He gets the ball out of his hands quick. He put up big numbers in the Baylor offense when he was there. He was a borderline first round pick until he went to Auburn. So like, there's a lot of good with Stidham. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of question marks there as well, 
So he's far from a sure thing, but I would like to see him get an opportunity to prove himself on the field as well. Um, and I think he's going to get that opportunity again, assuming that Cam doesn't go out and, and play like an MVP this year. If that happens and the Patriots feel like he's not going to drop off and he's going to continue playing that way, well, then you really don't have a choice but to keep him around, uh, you know, and to go out and to resign him at the end of this year. But, uh, but I, I would like to see Stidham get, get a chance. And then to me, if, if Stidham's not the guy, then you're going to have to, it's going to be rough for a few years, right? You're going to have to play with Stidham or you're going to have to draft someone else. To me, I feel like they believe that Stidham has it. And the, re- the only reason I'll say that is because before they brought Cam in for literally nothing, he's getting paid Brian Hoyer's. He has the same contract as Brian Hoyer, except he has, you know, incentives in his deal. Um, so before they did that, they didn't draft a quarterback. They didn't sign a quarterback. They didn't bring any, they didn't do anything. They, they did nothing. And they've been consistently drafting quarterbacks. Even when they had Brady, they've been consistently drafting quarterbacks in the third, fourth, fifth round, and even just taking shots in the dark later on in the draft. And they decided this year that they weren't doing that. And so what that and you now listen, Cam fell into their lap and, you know, at the end of June because no one wanted to sign him and they got him for nothing. But they weren't overextending for Cam Newton. They weren't doing that. And so, you know, I think to me what that shows me is that they were comfortable moving forward with Stidham as the guy. Now, whether they believe that he's going to be the guy or not, I don't know. But I think it was pretty clear before they brought Cam in that all of everything that they did was showing everyone that they had faith in Stidham moving forward, at least for now, right? Or and at least compared to other guys. And you look at they traded out Jared, uh, Love was still on, Jordan Love was still on the board. If they really felt like he was the next guy, they could have drafted him there at twenty three. They didn't. You know, there were other guys that were there. They could have taken. They didn't. So. To me, I just look at it and say, okay, well, they obviously believe that Stidham was good enough to be the guy this year. They also didn't even take a flyer on a guy. You know, Stidham was a fourth-round draft pick. They could have drafted a guy in the fourth or fifth round. And, yeah, maybe you say, oh, there's no one good or this and that or blah, 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 whatever. Sure, maybe. But, I mean, they've been doing that for years, and they didn't this year. And to me, there was a reason behind that, and that reason is because they're comfortable with Stidham moving forward. Makes sense. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'd like to see Stidham in some regular season right. action right. at some point. We, uh, we did. Know. He threw an interception and then they put Brady back in. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> one right. bad read, one bad throw. I mean, the right read, he just airmailed it. You know, Far, Favre's first pass was a, uh, was a pick six, I think too. Right. Wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. you never, you never really know until yeah. you know. Right. Um, so, but okay. Before I, Greg, I know you're jumping off it too. I, what? Quick, quick reaction take. Do we think Sam Darnold is the Jets' quarterback in the future? What are the Jets going to be like for the next year or two? Is Adam Gase good as gone? I just am curious what your guys' thoughts are there. Uh, my biggest fear is that Joe Douglas is going to figure out that he needs to fire Adam Gase and then <laughs> actually get somebody who fixes. Uh, you know, uh, Sam Darnold, because I actually like Darnold still. Yeah, I think he's a talented player. I think he's been given maybe not Josh Rosen bad, but been given a pretty raw deal as far as an opportunity to succeed. I think Douglas is a good GM. I think he's made some nice signings, some nice draft picks, and has will eventually get them going in the right direction. But, you know, if, if I could cut off my pinky toe to give Adam Gase a career contract with them, I'd, I'd consider it <laughs> to, to be able to lock it in. As long as he's there, they are not going to be any threat. And I think that, you know, playing, I'm so thankful the bills get to open with them the first week and they get to play them again in week seven before they get anything figured out with all the different pieces that they added. Um, I think they're going to get off to a disastrous start and then fire Gase in that. I do think Darnold still, the biggest piece of their future because he's, I think still a legitimate asset and can be done, but the exact opposite of what the bills have done with Josh Allen, they're going to have to make that fifth year decision on very incomplete data. And that I think they're going to do it out of just begrudging the obligation, but they're still going to have to exercise that without really knowing if he's the answer. I, I couldn't agree more. I literally could not have said it more perfectly. 
if, you know, Adam Gay stinks. He stinks. He's terrible. <laughs> and so as long as as long as he's there, Sam Darnold's going to stink, you know, and, and, and that's not that's not an indictment on Sam Donald. We don't know what Sam Donald can be. Maybe he's the guy. Maybe he isn't. We don't know that because we haven't seen it. Uh, and I, well, I shouldn't say we haven't seen it. We haven't seen it in a real offense. We haven't seen it with a real coordinator, right? He has Adam Gase and Adam Gase stinks. And so as long as he has Gase with him, you're not, you're going to have incomplete data on Sam Donald, right? I don't know if he can be the guy, I feel like he's better than what we've seen, but I guess we don't know because, because, you know, he plays in a, in a crap offense for a crap coach, you know? Hey, and so, hey, Pat, there's a, I had a guy, a, a Pats fan on my show, who's also a, a great wide receiver expert, Brad Kelly, and does a lot of breakdowns for us. Oh, he yeah. said his, his worst case scenario for the AFC East is that Brian Dable takes the knowledge from <laughs> You know, Belichick fixes Josh oh, Allen no, no. and then gets the Jets job and fixes Sam Darnold. That that was his worst case scenario. Is that true. he goes and fixes both of the basket case quarterbacks in the AFC East and then has to deal with it because somebody straightened him out. Yep, nightmare scenario for the for the Patriots and the Dolphins for sure. I mean, I, I, yeah, but that's what you need as a coach. You just you need a coach, and that's you know what honestly that's what and not to bring it back to the Patriots, but I this is what I do. That's that's the difference between Belichick and, and all the other coaches. Is Belichick spent so much time learning and, and learning the NFL offense and being able to teach an NFL offense to the guys and not relying specifically on his coordinators, and that makes such a difference to to what he's doing. And so you look at you know, and that's why coordinators can come in and out of there. And they, yes, of course, there's a drop off depending on what the coordinator was and and the reliance on the coordinator, but. That's why it's not as much of a drop off as there would be on other teams because he knows both the offense and the defense so well and is able to teach it. And I think that that's it just makes such a difference when you have a guy that can do that. Um, that how, you're, many you're seasons was there, how many seasons did they have without even having a defensive coordinator? Right. Right. I mean, Flores was never even officially the defensive coordinator before he got the job. So, like, yeah. you know, it just. That's but that's what they've been doing for years, and and again, it's having a reliance on that one guy is great. But then when he leaves, then the question is, who the heck's going to take his spot? And I was I was upset when Flo left because I was hoping he'd be the guy to take that spot. I don't know if I trust McDaniel's, um, but obviously, yeah, no, the no one will ever to. convince me that when he backed out of that Colts job that he didn't get the handshake deal from Kraft. No one will ever convince me that he's not yeah. the coach in waiting, regardless of what they announce. Right. Oh, I mean, I can't. Why the heck would he drop out of the Colts job unless he knew something about luck that we didn't, which, I mean, could yeah, be true. Yeah. But there you go. There you go. You know, but but regardless, it just seems really strange that he would drop out of that. Uh, but yeah, the well, there are 32 of those in the world and you're being offered one, you know, right. and you have your whole coach. It's, and it's not like he was in the interview and he was offered and he said no. He had his whole coaching staff like they, they were yeah. they were in. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah, it was, he's, it's, that's what it's got to be. I just I wonder if Belichick actually said by this point I'll retire because I'm not sure. I'm not sure Bill ever. You know, I could see him coaching for another long while. I think he. I think he still feels like he has a lot to prove. You know, with no Brady now and right. Um, well, that's why I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. So I don't know. Even though, even if there was a handshake deal there, like how long is McDaniel's going to wait for that job? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's fair. And so. does anyone here have – I've seen some – we all have crazy Jets fans in our mentions. So has <laughs> anyone here see, have any semblance of where some of this weird confidence is coming from, that they have some sneaky wild card run coming? Because I, I think they legitimately have maybe the second worst roster in the NFL. Oh, I know exactly where it's coming from. I know exactly where it's coming from. It's coming from the fact that they're Jets fans. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. They have no like. There are no wide receivers on that team. Like, I think they're down to like their sixth or seventh guys at this point. I think they have Braxton Berrios in line to start at this point. Like, we we've all had the Chris Hogan experience. They signed him and are starting him. He's starting in the year the year of our Lord twenty (laughs) twenty. Yeah, not great. I mean, they've they've had they've had probably outside of the Eagles and maybe the Chargers the worst injury luck of any team thus far yeah. through the off season. It's yeah. like once, once again, receivers. Once again, why I'm super excited for Sunday. 
Yeah, no, it, it's it's going to uh, be. Bills I, I think the form. Bills might be my my top lock for the yeah, week. Maybe Philly has, over Washington. Yeah, whatever but, money anyone here listening is comfortable wagering, please put it all on the Bills minus six and a half. They're going to cover. Oh, yeah. that, that, is that all it is? It's under it's a touchdown. It's insane. Fabulous. Complete insanity. Well, you know what's interesting for me? I'm in a I'm in a knockout pool with a, with a decent amount of people. It's just ten bucks, but like then the pot gets high because there's a bunch of people in it. And this year especially, I'm going with like all favorites right away because you just don't know what the heck's going to happen. Oh, right? so no there's going to be no some nothing. weird stuff Sunday for sure. Right. So I have I had two entries. One of them I chose the Chiefs because I'm like I'm not taking a chance. Like normally I would never choose a Chiefs week one, but it's like. Who the heck knows what's going to happen? Like, I'm not, you know, so I'm choosing the Chiefs. And I chose the Chiefs and I'm choosing the Bills because it's like those are the two games that I'm most confident about. There's no chance that those teams are going to lose. So I have to pick those two teams. And so, you know, that's that's kind of where I went. Normally, I wouldn't go that route, but it's like in, in this they're, year. They're the kind of games the that would end. Yeah. They're the kind of games that would end a, a you know, you knock out 75% of your pool if you have one of those. Right, right. right. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. This is awesome, guys. Really, yeah, I really yeah. appreciate it. This was a ton of fun. Looking forward to doing it again. Hopefully, we can uh, set these up going forward. Yeah.